Good afternoon. This is David Eastwood, Geotech Engineering and Testing. Welcome to the uh, geotechnical and environmental consideration for design of renewable petrochemical industrial and port facilities presentation. We've got a question here. Do we uh, hold, uh, do we still post the uh, recordings? Uh, if somebody wants to uh, get a copy of the presentation, uh, the recordings of it, uh, if you send me or Vicky Bonds an email, then we will give you the uh, uh, a copy of the recording. Okay, it's almost one o'clock now. Let's see, yeah, it is one. So we're gonna get started here. Let's see. This is a part two of a two two part program. Part one talked about field investigation, laboratory testing, foundations, and stuff like that. This is a part two that we're going to talk about pavements, roller compacted concrete, ground modification techniques, retaining walls, and slope stability. So this is a part two of a two part program. Uh, we got about 200 people RSVP'd. And we've got a lot of engineers, uh, that's what I can say, a lot of engineers that have registered. Uh, if you need to reach me, um, my name is David Eastwood. My email is de at geotecheng.com. And uh, my phone number is 713-699-4000. Geotech engineering and testing has been in business for 35 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials and geoforensic engineering. We got a staff of 60 engineers, geologists, technicians. We work all, all over Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. And we have our own drill rigs so we can get on projects quickly. If you have any questions as we go through the presentations, I will answer them as we go along. Please type your question in the Q&A answer, and I'll answer it as we go along. So, Let's see, industrial pavements. These are some industrial pavements that Port of Houston project. It's got roller compacted concrete here pavements. If you look at it, you, you know, Port of Houston is big <coughs> uh, on roller compacted concrete. They have been using it for a long time. These are industrial facilities with pavement systems, heavy pavements, trucks stuff. This is a Kroger facility. Uh, east of Houston, city of Houston, on heavy asphalt pavements. Again, more industrial. This is a uh, Ritchie Brothers auctioneer. This is their facility out there in Northeast Houston. Port of Houston pavement design. We were asked to, to do a pavement design for Jacinta Port project. And uh, they had all kinds of different loading on it. They had these forklifts, uh, roll trailers, Again, same team, roll trailers, crawlers, more forklifts, all kinds of heavy loads in that port, more forklifts. And, and so we had to come up with a pavement design. So we look at the traffic loading on that. Um, one option was look at forklifts and trucks by themselves. The other one was look at the mobile crane by itself. The other one was looking at the roll trailers by themselves. And uh, option number four was combining all this uh, equipment together and come up with a pavement design. So we went out there and studied each equipment for mobile crane. We looked at it, we had, you know, uh, tire pressures of 145 PSI, outrigger pressures of 1000 PSI. We look at the axles, how many tires and all that stuff. Uh, forklift trucks, 82,000 pounds capacity. Service weight was 52,000. Wheelbase, one, 197. Uh, we look at the roll trailers. There were 220,000 pounds capacity. Axle loads of 90,000 pounds. Real heavy loads. Eight wheels, four on each side. And then we look at the... Uh, 200, 220, 2250 crawler crane, capacity of 600,000 pounds and dimensions of 30, uh, 
and 30 foot nine inches by four inch by four foot. Then we look at the, the trucks, H HS25, uniform load of 1,000 PSF, container loads, 67,200 pounds each, stack six high. So we'll look at the pavement design for all this. We use the US Corps of Engineers pavement transportation computer assisted structural engineering software. And with that, for option number one, we came up with a 16 inch concrete pavement with a 3000 PSI strength or 14 inch with 4000 PSI. For option number two, we came up with 10 inch concrete with 3000 PSI or 4000 PSI with nine inch concrete. For option number three, we came up with 3000 PSI concrete, 16 and a half. If you use all of them together, we came up with 17 inch concrete pavement, 3,000 PSI or 4,000 or 15 inches. Roller compacted concrete. If you look at the roller compacted concrete, uh, Port of Houston uses a lot of roller compacted concrete. Roller compacted concrete essentially, essentially just a regular concrete with a slump of zero. And it's got very little water in it. It's got benefits of fast construction, it's economical, early load carrying capacity, supports heavy loads, low maintenance, durable, and unlimited applications. So they use them a lot for port facilities and also road projects. They use them for ports, warehouse facilities, parking areas, maintenance and storage yards, airport service areas, arterial roads, highway shoulders, local streets, pothole patches, so you go out there and compact that subgrade, you know, stabilize that subgrade, get it ready, just like any other kind of pavements. And um, in this case, you either go with lime it or lime flash it or cement stabilize it, depending on the soil type. Subgrade, they limed it 5% and cement 5%. That's the port project. Then they go out there, they use this asphalt pavement placement equipment that's actually modified for uh, for for roller compacted concrete, you apply it and you compact it with a steel drum roller. And here's a basically the paving train. If you look at it like that, that's a truck, and you just dump it in here, and they, this the equipment puts it up there. Here's a typical section. It's a 12 inch section of roller compacted concrete. You put it in, you got to go in there and compact it. It's got a zero slump on it. Use a steel drum roller to compact it. You got to put it in quickly. You know, you got to deliver it within 30 minutes from the plant to the job site. Then you go out there and run the density on it. Make sure it's compacted 98% standard proctor density. I got a question here. How about reinforcement and steel uh, spacing? Okay, for roller compacted concrete, you don't use the steel at all. There's no steel in it. Uh, you've got to put joints in it, but there's no steel in it. You run the density with a nuclear gauge, make sure it's got proper compaction. After placement, you go out there and put concrete curing compound on it. This is you can spray on it, or you can go out there and put plastic sheeting on it. Um, you can put water on it all the time, or you can put some kind of a asphalt emul emulsified stuff, which I would don't recommend. Some kind of a bituminous curing compound. But that's all, you gotta cure it right away. And then you go out there within eight to 12 hours, usually you go out there and uh, put it in uh, control joints, no more than 15 feet spacing. If you look at the initial manual for this thing, it says you don't need any joint spacing. But the new technology is talking about uh, you go in there and, and put in uh, joints in. Typically, if you saw cut it, you got one eighth of an inch saw cut, so you don't need joint filler. But if you got joints that are more than one fourth of an inch or wider, you put, you're supposed to go in there and fill it in. It's a typical uh, roller compacted concrete type pavement structure. Um, parking lots and roads. This is a typical RCC, roller compacted concrete. This is a regular pavement. This is asphalt. This is roller compacted concrete. 
you can diamond grind it to look like this, you know, like we do to get developed sounds. So that's what it looks like. Construction. In terms of construction of pavements, back in the old days, Romans used to have all these guys over here, these soldiers to monitor construction of the pavements. If the contractor cheated, they used to use these spears and they go out there and stab them with the spears. Nowadays, we do reports when we say things don't pass. So first you go out there and do clearing and grubbing out there, take out all the trees out. You gotta go in there and make sure you take all the roots out. These trees, they got big roots. You got to get all that stuff out. All these soft spots in here, you got to debuck it. Take out all the soft spots and bring in on-site material. Put it in lifts and compact it and check for compaction. See all the soft spots over here. Just don't push some dirt in there. That's not acceptable. You got to put soils in. It could be on-site material or fill material, structural fill. Put it in lifts and compact it. Don't use fill with organics in it. This is not acceptable. You got roots or root organics, it decays, creates voids. These kind of organics are not acceptable here. You can't build your pads out there with a bunch of root organics. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. Not acceptable. Get all the organics out. Proof roll it using TxDOT, standard. You get a loaded dump truck, you fill it up with soil. You go out there and make sure there's no deflection here. If this deflection is there, it's not acceptable. This is not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable. So if you got pavements with poor uh, proof rolling, it's not acceptable. Make sure it passes the proof rolling. You can compact that soil with a steel drum roller. If it's sandy, if it's clay, you can pack it with a, uh, with a sheep's wood roller. Make sure you check the compaction with the nuclear gauge. Make sure it's properly compacted. And the way you run a nuclear gauge, you poke a hole with this device in here with this rod in the soil. You put your instrument in there. Okay, and, and then this, this is a cesium-137 and it emits uh, fo photons, gamma rays, and they got a receiver here from the source to receiver. If there's a lot of photons come in, that means it's poorly compacted. If it's a little bit come in, that means it's properly compacted. It's good correlations there. You compact that soil, you seal them with pneumatic roller, you compact it with a sheep's foot roller. You seal it when it rains, water doesn't penetrate the soil. Here's all you, how you seal it. You can see the loose soil here and here's the sealed soil. Subgrade stabilization, we do chemical stabilization. Typically, if your soil's got a PI of less than 15, use cement or lime flash. Between 15 and 35, you can use either lime, lime flash or cement. After PI of 35, you use lime. So, Lime stabilization, we typically use lime slurry, type B. And, and uh, it's a type B lime. You cure it for 24 to 72 hours. Gradation, 100% passing 1.75 inch sieve. 85% pass 0.75 inch sieve. 60% pass 4 sieve. Compact at optimum plus 3%. So you scrape the ground. You take out all the grass and weed out there. You bring your lime, lime slurry. And, uh, you mix it in, so your lime slurry right there coming in. Add water if you need to. Let it hydrate for 24 to 72 hours. It breaks down the soil. You cure 24 to 72 hours to obtain optimum hydration. Then use a pulverizer here. You mix it in. The lime in there, you chop it to small pieces so that it passes gradation. That's the natural soil, the way it, what it used to look like. You, you apply the lime to it, it becomes like sandy material. The texture changes to completely. It becomes like sandy. You run it through the sieves, make sure it's got proper gradation. You compact it with a sheep's wood roller and then seal it with a pneumatic roller to seal it pretty good. 
you check the density, make sure it's properly compacted. If you want to know the thickness of this stabilized layer, you go get some fan oil flame, you spray it on the side of a hole, and you can see the depth of stabilization line it turns purple. Fanol failing reacts with lime, it becomes purple. You do lime testing every thousand feet, density testing every thousand feet, gradation every thousand feet. This is a lime stabilized subgrade. It's a typical lime stabilized subgrade site. When you lime stabilize that subgrade, that lime sucks the moisture out of the subgrade. The soil starts becoming dry, develop shrinkage cracks. These shrinkage cracks, if you pour concrete and the soil is very dry, sucks moisture out of the concrete and develops reflective cracking. So you make sure you don't have too much shrinkage cracks in your subgrade before you pour the concrete. This is too dry if you subgrade, if you pour concrete on it. This is too dry. So what you need to do, remove this steel, add a bunch of water and relime re it and, and make sure you don't have all these cracks on it and pour concrete. The way to determine lime content, you can either add enough to get the PI to less than 20 or use adds and grime technique uh, procedure. Make sure your soil that's stabilized got a pH of 12.4. Or you use this text dot chart in here, you get the PI and here's a percent of soil binder, typically 100%. So for a fine clay, you know, you go, so if your PI is 50, you got to go up here, you need about six, 7% lime. Okay, that's a simple way to calculate how much lime you need. Okay, you can do cement stabilization or fly ash. Use uh, if you if your soils are sandy, you will be using cement stabilization. And uh, so, if your PI is less than fifteen, use cement or use lime fly ash. You go get that cement. Use a type C cement. Mix it dry or slurry. Apply water. Compact near optimum. Compact within two hours. You scrape the ground, add water if you need to. You can apply dry like this cement. It's a dry, or you can apply slurry. It comes out of the back of the truck as a slurry liquid. Then you go out there and pulverize it. You mix it all up. Make sure you got proper gradation, compact, and finish within two hours. So you can't get a big section. You got to apply it. Polarize it and compact it within two hours. Make sure you got proper gradation. Small pieces, you cannot have anything bigger than three inch in there. Compact it with a sheep's foot, seal it with a pneumatic. That's all you do is check it with a density nuclear gauge. This is micro cracking. Cement stabilized subgrade gets very hard. And so if you put an asphalt paving on top of it, these cracks shows up in the asphalt pavements on the surface as as reflective cracking. So what we recommend is you get a light construction equipment. After you stabilize, you go with a stabilized subgrade, develop micro cracking in it so that uh, it doesn't become so rigid and it doesn't really get out there and develop cracks through your asphalt pavements. Lime fly stabilization, you use lime and then you go apply a flash on top of it. Or you can do it all one time called live fly, single mix, like true blend type stuff. You compact within two hours, no more than six hours after adding the mix and last stabilizing agent. You go apply the lime in there first, you pulverize it, mix it together, then you bring your fly ash dry, you apply the fly ash, add water. You, after, you, after that, you start mixing it and start compacting it within two hours of commencing compaction or not more than six hours after adding the last stabilizing agent. You pulverize it and compact it with a sheep's foot roller. Check the density, make sure it's got proper density on it. Proper subgrade elevation. When we do stabilization, make sure we know proper stabilization. If we give you a stabilization for the, at this level here, just on the surface, that may not be the good for this, this area here. That's why it's very important during the construction, we go get bag sample of the material and then come up with a stabilization at that time. We can give you some preliminary stabilization, but we don't know what the final elevation of the pavement is gonna be. If it's gonna be three foot down, 
then we have to give you a stabilization for three foot down, not on the surface. So what happens on a lot of road projects, they do a cut. This is the subgrade, not here. So you got to make sure you got the proper elevations for the sub subgrade. Freshwater table in parts of Houston, we have these sandy soils over the clay and the sands, you know, this is a regular groundwater table about 20 feet deep. This is a perch water table about 12 inches deep. You could dig a hole if it fills up with water. This happens when you have sand over clay, clay being impermeable, water does not have any place to go. So water stays in the sand, develops this perch water table condition. You take out the trees and grass, the soil becomes really mushy like this, real soft. And it holds water because the water cannot go anywhere when you take out the sand. Water just sits on top of the clays. This is a perch water table condition. You excavate a beam on a slab for it, the beam gets filled up with water. Water just trapped on the surface. This is a perch water table condition. Here's a truck out there getting stuck. And you got a perch water table condition. You got sand over clay, real soft sand there. How to improve the sites that are pumping. You can scarify it and open it up to dry up. You can improve the drainage. You can do soil mixing. You can do chemical soil stabilization. You can do removal and replacement. Scarify it, open up to dry up. You can open up the area that's pumping. Let it dry up. A lot of times it's not practical because it rains again. We have a rain every two, three days here. So this may not work. Improve drainage. If your site is pumping, you go out there and start cutting out these what's called bleeder ditches. You put them at 100 foot spacing and let it drain the sand and silts. It drains the water from sand and silts and you connect it. You got a one here, you got one here, you got one there. You connect it to some kind of a detention pond and drain that water and then just dump it to neighbor's property. The other option is mix the on site sands with silts and silts with clays. A lot of times, a lot of these sites, they got detention ponds and they have some clay there. So if you got detention ponds that they got clay or channels that are digging on the projects, got clay in it, you take that clay, haul it to the job site and mix it and disc it in with the sands. And uh, you use a pulverizer, you disc it in and you mix it and that would reduce the pumping and then you compact it with a sheepswood roller. Chemical stabilization improvement. You know, if you got to modify your soils, if it's wet, you want to just dry the soil up, not stabilize it, just to dry it up. You can go out there and apply some dry lime in there. And, uh, or you can use quick lime, but don't use a slurry lime. You can mix it up with the soil that would remove, basically dries up that soil. You can also remove and replace the, the soil with good soil. You can dig out the sandy soils out there and uh, take out the sandy soils, bring in select fill or structural fill with clay in it, replace the sand. It's typically these sands on the surface may be two foot, three foot, four foot. So, you know, it, it's typically it's not very economical to take it out. The most economical thing is just to do bleed or ditch it, let it, you know, dry out. But uh, you remove the sand and replace it with structural fill. Dewatering, well point system. If you do excavations out there for industrial projects, 
you have to get that water down as you do excavations to get that groundwater down. You can do that by placement of well point systems. These well point systems are placed eight to 10 foot spacing around the excavation. The lifts of these things are about 15 to 18 foot deep. So if the excavation is more than 18 foot deep, you got to put multi-layered well point system, multi-stage. So here's a typical channel, you know, dewatering system. You go out there and put your well points in it or a detention pond. You put the well points in there connected to a suction pump. The way you put the well point in there, you drill a hole in the ground. You got these PVC pipes like that. They're perforated. And uh, the, uh, you put them in the ground, connect it to a, a suction pump. You suck the water out and you drain, drain it out off site. So this is an Air Lakeet project right there in, in uh, Laporte. They had a fire water detention pond. And uh, here's a dewatering system. This is a header pipe, suck the water out. That's a suction pump. This is a downtown medical center excavation. You can see well points, suction pump, well points. If your excavation is more than 18 feet, you got to put multi-stage. You got one point over here, brings the groundwater <laughs> down. You put another one here, you bring the groundwater down. You put another one here, you bring the groundwater down. It's a typical multi-stage for a deep excavation. The natural groundwater is at this level here. By putting multi-stage dewatering system, your groundwater becomes like here. You want to get that water at least three foot below the bottom of the excavation. So for surface shallow uh, dewatering, use some pump system. It goods basically for gravels and sandy soils, even clay soils. You could use it, you can use well points. to dewater sandy gravel soil down to fine sands. Okay, you put the dewatering in the sand layer. Use it for open excavations, piped trenches, quick and easy with a lift of about 18 feet. That means you can dewater to a depth of 18 feet. You can use deep wells with electric, electric submersible pumps. And this is for gravel, sand, and seal type materials. Deep excavations, there's no limitation to the depth of drawdown. Wells can be designed to draw the water from several layers. Or you can use a jet ejector, uh, ejector system using high pressure well, high pressure water to create vacuum, use it for silty sands and sandy silts for deep excavations in space so confined that the multi-stage well point system cannot work. No limitations to the depth. Storage tanks. A lot of the industrial facilities, they got these storage tanks. These are metal steel tanks sitting on ring walls. Typically, you, you know, you got some kind of a dike around it. The typical, you got them all east of Houston. You go out there, our petrochemical complexes. This is in Leak City. It's a new tank that's going up there right now. You got a ring wall system. That's the steel plate, compacted sand underneath it or you can have actually a concrete floor. This is the case where you have a concrete floor with a ring wall. If your soils are soft, you put some kind of a sheet piling around it to make sure the edge failure does not occur. The deeper the sheet pile, the higher the factor of safety against edge failure. You have that here and you have it in here too for deep failure, soft soils, you use a sheet pile there. It could be four foot long, something like that, just to increase the factor of safety. The type of, type of failures we have for storage tanks is base shear failure. 
That usually doesn't happen very often. You need a minimal factor of safety of 1.3. We have edge shear failure. This happens a lot. So you got to make sure these soft soils here doesn't fail. You can have a ring wall here, drop some sheet piling to bring it here so that this thing, the failure surface got to go all the way down here. That way it doesn't fail. This is a water tank out there in Annis, Texas, near Dallas. In 2005, we went out there, the bottom blew out and the whole water just flooded the whole neighborhood. And uh, it just, the whole bottom went out there, it was a crack, the water got in there and just busted it. That poor compaction out of the tank, they had a concrete floor, it just cut through the, the, the water, cut through the concrete like butter. This was a 70 foot tall tank with 4,000 PSF con contact pressure. And you can see how it busts up the concrete. This is a subgrade preparation for some tanks that we did, oil tanks out there in Beaumont, Texas. These are 220 foot diameter tanks. The bottom was soft. We told them to lime stabilize the top 24 inches. And then they put the ring wall in there above the ground to anticipate the anticipated settlement. The, the edge of the ring wall was supposed to settle 15 inches. So this is the ring wall around the tank and you let it settle, you know, anticipate, you just stick it above the ground. That's the oil tank there, compact, you know, you put it in, you paint it to build a wall, the tank, you go out there and remove all the grass and trees. Then you gotta go proof roll the whole area, make sure it doesn't deflect like this, not acceptable. Dig out the soft spots and bring in good material. Uh, there's a question here. Do we have any uh, settlement criteria for tank foundations? API tank design has got criteria that the structural engineers use for tank. Our job is to tell you what the center settlement is and edge settlement. Usually the center settlement is two thirds higher than the edge. So if your settlement at the center is 10 inches, at the edge is seven inches. And so, uh, but API has got criteria for that. If you want to send me an email, I'll send you the criteria. Take out the soft spot, compact everything. Go out and get it all set up. You check the compaction as you compact it. And then you put your steel in or concrete, finish it, make concrete cylinders, make sure you got good concrete, start framing it. Put this a water tank structure. Bottom steel plates kind, you gotta put it in, weld it. This is a tank foundation right there. A lot of times you put dikes around your tanks, you make sure you got a slopes of three to one here on clay soils, four to one on sands. This is a tank out there, Laredo, Texas, had a fixed roof on it. This tank was had problems with it and you had settlement problems, leaking problems. The interior, they put a sheet, sheet on the bottom of it, steel sheet. These are the columns inside the tanks. The columns were sitting on steel plates. A lot of patches, there's a pipe going into it. When you remove this pipe, it was a big sound because these things were deflected. Poor drainage around the tank, tank bottom was rusting, it was all flat around the tank, no drainage, space between the bottom of the tank and subgrade, poor drainage. We had to go inside, do borings, see what kind of soils we have underneath the tank. How soft was it? What we have to do to stabilize the tank. A lot of industrial projects got a rail on them. 
He was ballast in there and sub ballast. We design these things and construct them. These ties are old and beat up. You got to put good ties in here. These are the ballasts. You design these rail projects based on ERMA, Manual of Railway Engineering, 2021. You got a big chapter all over the place. This is a typical design for Union Pacific that where you have your, your rail ties in here, you put ballast, you put sub ballast in there. You may stabilize the subgrade. You go in there on a two to one, three to one slopes out there with your ballast. You come back, you go to the ditch on a three to one slope, so four to one slope of the soils are sandy. These are typical designs for Union Pacific. A lot of these railroad projects, they've got, uh, uh, they've got bridges here. These are old bridges that they have to, you know, they have new bridges now. Retaining walls, bulkheads. A lot of industrial facilities, we need to come up with design of sheet pile walls. These walls sometimes crack and all that stuff. So you gotta have to design them properly. These are sheet pile walls along Galveston Bay. Condominiums. Sheet pile walls are like this, the shape of them to give them high moments of inertia. This is a project out there. We talked about it before. Well, firewater pond for Air Lakeet out there, Laporte. They drove the sheet pile again, but the hydrostatic pressure make the sheet pile wall bend. They didn't consider the hydrostatic pressure in sheet pile wall design. We always assume the water at the table for saturated conditions because of our hurricane conditions. So when you do sheet pile wall design, you're gonna assume the water behind the wall at the surface. These are some sheet pile walls that are failing in Florida. They had to go back in and put new sheet pile walls in, about 40 foot deep. This are the new sheet pile wall. That's what it looks like. Nice, it's a nice facility there, beautiful houses. Again, sheet pile walls, they got anchoring system. This is the sheet pile wall going out there in, in uh, uh, Colorado River out there near Bay City. This is the STP site, the nuclear plant site. They had a lot of erosions here on their channels. So they drove some sheet piling in there. This is the tie back coming in like that. Yeah, you drill the hole and grout the tie back. It's a tie back like that. Sheep eye wall going this way. This is the banks. You put in the uh, you, put, you put in the, your your mats in there. These are articulated mats. Put gravel in there and then you put art articulate mats on top of it. This is a downtown Houston text dot. There's a big ditch over here. They want to protect it against failure to drive some sheet piling in there. It's a vibratory hammer. This is the ditch. You drive this thing. It's a male and female. Connection. Uh, we got a question in here. Are the issues putting the new sheet pile wall next to existing? I would think the new wall would have to be on the land side, not between the existing wall and the wa water side. Um, well, I mean, you can drive a sheet pile next to an existing one, you know, you can drive, you know, you gotta be at least, you know, maybe a couple of feet away, but they shouldn't be up. You can put it on each side of the existing sheet pile wall, I think, because I mean, 
unless some of these walls are deforming. But you know, in general, you should be able to put them in next to each other. Uh, I don't have a whole lot, a lot of experience about putting sheet pile walls next to each other, but just from just thinking about it, it just seems like you should be able to put them together near each other. We got a chat here. It says to be on the safe side, we always recommend anchor sheet pile walls rather than cantilever. It depends on the depth of the excavation. But typically when our uh, unsupported length more than 15 feet, we recommend anchor sheet pile wall. But if your unsupported link is less than 15 feet, generally cantilever sheet pile wall is more economical. Anyway, in this case, they went out there and put a jogging track on top of where they drove the sheet pile wall. This is the ditch in here. This is the where they drove the sheet pile wall. This is uh, Brazos River, uh, the bridge over the Brazos River on 59 South near Sugarland. They built some coffer dams to put the foundations in for the bridge. This is the tiebacks for the sheet pile walls. This is the active pressure, passive pressure. The hydrostatic pressure, this is gamma H. This is gamma H right there. Anchor sheet pile walls. Use anchor sheet pile walls whenever you unsupported link. That means from here, where the grade is, to here is more than 15 feet. Use anchor sheet pile wall. These are hydrostatic pressures. Anchor sheet pile wall, free earth method. This method assumes that the soil at the lower end of the piling is incapable of production, effective restraint from passive pressure to induce negative bending moment, which means that the tip of the sheet pile can move. Here's a typical deflection curve. This is the shear and this is the moment for a typical free earth method. Uh, there's another one which is more conservative called fixed earth method. This method assumes that the bulkhead tip is restrained. It doesn't move. Consequently, the wall uh, were, acts like a partially built-in beam subject to bending moment. This is it. It fixed. It, it, there's no deflection at the tip. And you can see the shear in here. Just the deflection. And here's the moment. Factor of safety for bulkhead design, you either increase the penetration based on free earth method by 40, 20 to 40%, or use a factor of safety of two on passive pressure. A lot of times I use a passive, passive pressure factor of safety of two. Rose moment theory, these, uh, these sheet pile walls are pretty flexible. And when the sheet pile wall is flexible, it doesn't carry as much moment that our calculations show. So there's a reduction in moment due to wall flexibility called the rose moment. So when you go through the sheet pile wall design, make sure you look at that. When you put your anchors in, don't put it within the active zone. You got to take it out of the active zone. It's a passive zone. You got to put it outside here. That's where your anchor goes. If you put it over here, your anchor is not working. A lot of the wall failures that put the anchors too close to the wall. Here's a sheet pile wall. These are the tie rods. Go to the anchoring system. Sheet pile wall, tie rod, tie rod. This is the anchor. It's a typical deflections and shear usually control the design. Backfill with flowable fill or lean concrete to increase shear stiffness. This is the anchoring system. This is the passive pressure on the anchoring system, 2C, two times the shear strength. This is the ultimate factor, of, uh, and, and 2C is the ultimate passive pressure. It's a double sheet pile wall system for a failure. You always check for global stability. If this is your sheet pile wall, you want to make sure it's got a global stability, a factor of safety of ready than usually about 1.4. You can run it for short term, long term, and rapid drawdown, and you will have different factors of safety 1.3, 1.4, and 1.25. Golfer Dam, this is a 
San Jacinto River out there near uh, ITN area. A lot of barges hit the bridge. So they put these sheet, uh, the, the coffer dams out there to protect the bridge against the, the barges hitting the sides of the bridge. These are big coffer dams in Ch South China Sea. They're building islands. You can see the big coffer dam. They put them in the ground. Look at the people. It's so small. They put them out there and uh, around this structure and uh, fill them up with soil. Make a military base out of it. Soil nailing. As a retaining wall system, you saw nailing is one of the options that we use a lot in Texas. You can stabilize the slopes and retaining walls and excavations. You drill a hole, you put the nail in there, and you grout it. Saw nail walls, these walls consist of a large number of reinforcing elements uh, drilled and grouted into the ground. Nails are installed as, as the excavation progresses downward. As each level of nails is completed, reinforcing mesh and gunite are placed. And you shoot gunite on there, one excavation. Once the excavation is complete, permanent facing is, is installed for the nails. These are sore nails, the Harris County Flood Control Project here in Harris County. You go in there and you, know, you can fill the area between the nail and the forming here with concrete. And that's what it looks like. These are weep holes. These whip holes, they got plastic underneath them, basically geogrids or geotextiles to keep the fines from uh, coming out. This is a state highway 288 soil nailing. They wanted to remove these embankments from the freeway. They go out there and start removing the embankment, start starting nailing from top to the bottom. You mark the areas. You go and start drilling out there with auger it. These are your saw nails. You put your steel in it. They've got basically isolators that isolates the bar from the sides and centralizes it, centralizers. Then you start grounding it. The 3,000 PSI concrete at 28 days. Actually, 3,000 PSI grout at seven days. I got a question. Okay, the question is, construction-wise, how the concrete flume construct behind a wall? I don't know what the question is now. What's, I don't know what's the, uh, I couldn't get, I didn't get, get the question. I don't know what the question is. So you start uh, grouting the holes. Soil nail grout, grout should be nailed with cement and sand cement with seven day compressive strength of 3000 PSI. This is your gunite. You apply to the facing after you put your steel mesh in there. That's your gunite. If you do a saw nailing, that's the gunite right there. You add water to it at the, at, at, at the nozzle here. Basically, this is shot creek or mortar concrete that's pneumatically projected onto the surface. If it's wet, it's called gunite. If it's, if it's dry, it's gunite. If it's wet, it's pre-mixed. It's just a wet mixed. Then you put the surface facing on it on, on the soil nail wall. Slope stability. Uh, somebody asked a question here. I didn't un understand the question, so please repeat your questions. Maybe make it simpler so I can understand what the question is. Slope stability. By the way, on these retaining wall slope stability, we have a whole program on them. This is a short version of it that I'm covering here today, but. Uh, there's another section of it covering that we cover in a whole program that's coming up next couple of months through ASCE. If anybody's an ASCE member, you're gonna get that. There's a free presentation on slope stability 
retaining wall, water, wastewater, and road, road projects. This is a slope stability. We have a lot of slope failures in, in Houston and Harris County area. It's a parking lot that's failing. This is a bridge. You got the embankment failing. And more failure there. See a bridge abutment failing. This is a roadway. You see the lane failing here. One of the lanes got next to the bayou. It's a white oak bayou. The whole thing failed. They drove sheet piling here, two rows of sheet pile, one row here, one row here. This is the new lane they're gonna put in. Two, and they put riprap on top of it. A lot of grass grow through the riprap. You go back a year later, that's what you see the grass growing through the riprap. More slope failure type structures are on the bayous. This is a wedge block failure. The whole thing moves like a block. This is a seepage through the sandy soil failure. Deep rotational failure. A lot of the slope stability, we control it by design. It's good document and geotechnical guidelines by Harris County Flood Control. Just came out December 31st, 2021. It's good reading. A lot of dispersive soils in Harris County. Dispersive soils that are easily eroded when they get wet. These soils contain high percentages of sodium ions. So if you look at some of our channels, you will see all these holes in the channels. These are due to presence of dispersive soils. These are called jug holes. This is a detention pond out there in Veterans Memorial, Bentway 8. And uh, if you go look at it, they got some holes in it. There was a cop chasing somebody out there, falls into one of these holes and break his back. This is the dispersive holes. I had to pull the guy out. Rapid drawdown, when you do a slope stability, you check for short-term condition, long-term condition, and rapid drawdown. Sure. Basically, rapid drawdown is when the water comes up and it draws, drops. This is Colorado River. These people are just sitting here having fun in the afternoon. Starts raining. The guy's a gator guy from Florida. The water starts coming up. We got alligators in the water. They're still still there. Water is coming up. They're still sitting in there underneath the water. The water starts dropping, the slope gets saturated, the high pore pressure is in the soil, reduce the effective stress in the soil, and they get slope failure. So everything behind the bulkhead starts failing. It's called rapid drawdown. You can see all the bulkhead dropping. So when you do a slope stability, you do it for short-term condition, which is an undrained condition, end of construction, long-term condition, after the slope has been in place for a while, it swells from a change from a short-term parameters to a long-term sandy type parameter, C and phi. For short-term, you only you have undrained, you got C, phi zero. Then you got a rapid drawdown condition where you got pore pressures developed in the slope, the water comes up, you develop pore pressure in the soil, it reduces the effective stress, and the slope starts failing and there's no time for drainage. You need factors of safety of 1.3 for short term, 1.5 for long term, 1.25 for rapid drawdown. These are factors of safety that are assigned by Harris County Flood Control. It's a short term condition. This is your slope right there. You model it. This is your water table. You got undrained conditions. You got only C in here. You got a factor of safety of 2.8. Then you go long term, your factor of safety drops to 2.2. Your factors, you got C and phi angles in here, lower strengths. Then you got rapid drawdown, water jumps up to the surface, up high. You develop pore pressures in the soil, reduces the effective stress. You got a factor of safety of 2.03.
Buffalo Bayou still prepare. Um, this is a golf course out there on San Felipe. Beautiful place next to ba Buffalo Bayou. They were going to stabilize some of these slope failures here. They, they go in there and put some geotextiles in here for erosion protection, but they didn't do anything about the global stability. They didn't check that. So after they did it, then all of a sudden they started developing failures. The slopes will start failing. Can't play golf out past his red line. Bunch of attorneys. The whole slopes start failing. They put some inclinometers in there. These are PVC pipes, four inches in diameter. On the, at the bottom of the toe of the slopes, to see the deflections of the, the soil below the, the toe of the slope, checking for global stability. These are the basically inclinometers. They got this device that runs inside the PVC pipe. And it shows if this is the natural grade at the depth of three meters, it stops moving about four meters, three and a half meters. But the top area starts moving as a function of time. This is one to one, you know, six months, zero, six months, all the way down here. This starts with this actually, zero, six months, a year, all that. That's the first initial measurements. Then you can see the top four and a half, three and a half meters is moving. In here, you see the top two and a half meters is moving. And here you see the top three meters is moving. So to stabilize the slopes here, they put in straight shaft walls, concrete walls, soldier pile systems all around here. The Buffalo Bayou to stabilize it. By the way, it's a beautiful house out here in the middle of this thing. Uh, repair techniques, they use soldier piles. That's what it looks like. That's when you drill drill shafts right next to each other and it becomes a wall. So that's what they used. Hardest slopes to stabilize, Buffalo Bayou, Brazos River, Trinity River, and Cypress Creek. Brazos River, you got a bunch of sandy soils. If you look at the banks of the Brazos River, they're almost vertical with sandy soils. Every year, use a couple of feet of this natural ground due to erosion. It's too expensive to stabilize this thing. Buffalo Bayou has got the shallower heights of the embankments, but lots of sand and silt, lots of erosion. A lot of expensive homes are built near it. Erosion protection. Grass is the cheapest erosion protection you can use on your channels and detention ponds. Seabend stabilization of the clay slopes for slope protection. This is STP sites out there, nuclear plant in Bay City. They went in there and cement stabilized all their the detention pond side slopes. It's been sitting there like 40 years. On the other side, they use grass. This is all cement stabilized sand, and here's grass. You can use riprap to stabilize your slopes if the flow velocity is not very high. It's much better than grass, it's more expensive. That's the outfall. They put riprap. Uh, textile likes to use geogrid out there underneath it uh, to keep the fines in place. And uh, you got the riprap on top of it. For higher velocity, use concrete lining. This concrete pavers, and uh, you know they're, they're very good. And uh, you, you should have a minimum slope of two to one behind the pay the concrete paving. Okay, somebody asking a question. Can we use shotcrete for slope protection? 
And if yes or deep, how thick it, how thick it can stabilize? Well, I mean, we use shock creek when these things are vertical. There's no reason to use shock creek. If it's three to one slopes, you just use regular concrete. There is no, it's more expensive to use shock creek on that. If your slopes are vertical, I would use shock creek. But um, if it's a three to one, two to one slope, use regular concrete paving. This is a concrete paving. It's got a slope of one and a half to one. It failed. This is in Clear Lake City. Got gumbo clays underneath it. The whole thing failed. That's why I said do not use the slopes steeper than two to one behind the concrete paving. Some of the failures, US 90, and you can see the concrete uh, is failing in here on the slopes. I don't know if they use shot creek or this, this is concrete. I don't know if it's shot creek, but I think it's concrete and it's failing. And so they have to go out there and dig it all out. Putting soil nailing in there. Drill the holes for soil nailing. Putting their steel in there, the bars, they grout it. That's the wall. I put a steel mesh with a shot creek. That's what it looks like. Articulate a mat. You got high velocity flow in your channel. Articulate a mat, a great erosion protection system. They don't stabilize the slopes, global stability. They only are for erosion purposes. You put them with a the mat, this is the bar right there. You lay them down. Grass will grow through them, articulated mats. You got wires going through them. You got plastic sheeting, you got geo grid underneath them to keep the fines in. In areas such as Brazos River where you got major erosion problems, sandy soils, one way to stabilize them is uh, using this system of uh, stabilization, Gabion, I, I couldn't think of the name, Gabion systems, they work both as retaining wall and, and erosion protection. They're awesome materials, Gab Gabions are. Natural soil grows through them. Grass go through and become green option. Basically, it's chicken wire. You fill it out with rock. So usually it lasts about 75 years. This is the Houston Tennis Club out there on Memorial, where you got gabions, you got plants growing through it. It's terraced, stabilizes the slope. So your, your erosion protection depends on your uh, water velocity. If your water velocity is less than four feet per second in your channel. Use sandy, you have sandy materials, you can use grass line. If you have clay material, you can go up to about six feet per second. Riprap, eight feet per second. Riprap gradation two, 10 feet per second. Articulated mats, articulated block lined, 10, concrete line 12. So just depending what you got, you got different uh, velocities that you can tolerate with these erosion protection techniques. Detention ponds, a lot of industrial facilities, they got detention ponds and they got geo, 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 geotextiles in here, membrane type stuff, geo membranes to keep the chemicals from entering the soil and groundwater system. You can see the detention pond in here. These are detention ponds. You dig a hole in the ground. Make sure your slopes are at least three to one. It's a detention pond right there. If your soils are sandy, you go a four to one. This is the biggest detention pond in the world. That's the STP sites. 
nuclear power plant in Bay City. The side slopes here are semen stabilized. You see they're all, you know, benched. This is Art Story Park out there, Harris County. Various flood control detention pond. Textile detention pond on, at the I-10 and uh, Bedway 8 on the west side. Got a pilot channel here. Sometimes you want to have a recreational pond that, that you don't want the water to, to go, disappear. So you put a clay liner on your detention pond, usually about 24 inches thick. Make sure your clay liner has got a liquid limit less than 50 PI between 15 and 30. Percent passing number 200. 60 to 85, and the soil should be non-dispersive. Non -dis Using pin pinhole test. So you got a hot hydrostatic pressure that wants to push it out. So as you excavate it quickly, you may have to dewater. And then you fill that with water as soon as possible to, to re reduce your hydrostatic pressure to tear off your clay liners. And you can see the clay liner. Pipelines, open trench excavations. Some of these large diameter pipes, you put them in the ground, you use a trench box to put them in, you excavate. It's an open excavation. You check the compaction behind the water lines. This is a sand backfill or natural soil backfill for the regular pipeline. Pipe bridges, they're supported on piles of pipe bridges or drill piers. These are supported in pile, on piles. This is supported on piles. Trenchless technology. The trenchless technology is a construction or rehabilitation of underground utilities with minimum use of open cut excavation. The biggest one that's industrial guys use is horizontal directional drilling and augering. It basically goes from one end to the other, goes across the river or something like that that you're looking at. You basically poke the hole at, at an angle you go out there, this is where it comes out and you get your pipe from there. You got a reamer, you pull it back up, you bring it back up in here. You drill a slurry. Your reamer is, 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 is bigger than your actual pipe size. And the back, the space between the pipe and the hole is kept open with a slurry, bed night slurry. This is the pipe going across this river here. It goes at an angle and here it comes out over here. This is Houston airport system. And you can see the horizontal directional drilling going out there. That's what the device is. It goes on an angle. This is the tank mud pit, mud pit. There's lots of bentonite in there. You mix it in. This is your reamer. You pull your pipe behind the reamer. Typically, horizontal directional drilling is good if you got soft clays. Start going to the dense sand and all that, good. Very loose to very dense gravel, marginal. When you start going to gravel, it doesn't do a good job horizontal directional drilling. Uh, if you got gravel by weight, 50 to 85%, it's not any good. Loose to very dense gravel, unacceptable. Rock, if it's soft rock, it, it can go, but if it's a hard rock, it cannot go. This is gravel. HCD cannot go through gravel easily. Augering, a lot of projects we do augering, go out there, you need to have a pit. It goes from pit to pit. These are the augers. You got a pipe there, you got an auger inside of it. You do the pit first, 
You put the machine in there. This is the head. It's got water. It just goes through. Pull the pipe out. Ground modification techniques, chemical stabilization, lime slurry pressure injection. If you got highly expansive soils, you want to stabilize them, use lime slurry pressure injection. You get lime, you mix this tank in here, and you inject it into the soil. Usually go 10 foot deep in Houston area. If I'm in College Station, I may go down 15 feet in San Antonio, 15 feet in Dallas, 15 feet. Austin, 15 feet into the gumbo clay. You inject the lime. It does iron exchange. What it does, it removes this, uh, the sodium and potassium and puts some calcium in there. These are clay particles. They are negative charge and they got the water. It's got the positive charge in there. When you do cation exchange, this layer becomes smaller. It doesn't absorb water as much. The soil becomes less expansive. So that's what you do with it uh, when you have cation exchange, when you do chemical injection. Here's another chemical injection. It's basically sulfuric acid, very low grade, very diluted. You mix it in with water, you inject it into the soil. And what it does is reduce the negative charge on the clay platelets, and it doesn't absorb water as much, so it makes the soil non-expansive. You can do it by hand. Soil types where the chemical injections are good. The soils that have got highly expansive soils, they call the crack in the summertime, develop shrinkage cracks. Water can flow through these cracks. You get everywhere. Pavements with geograde reinforcements and separations. These pavements, you have geosynthetics, we have geotextiles, we have geogrids, geocells, and geomembranes. Okay, for pavements, we use the reinforcement grant modifications, we use geogrids. Geogrid is a deformed or non deformed grid like polymer formed by intersection ribs used for. Reinforcement with foundation soil. And you can see the geogrids like that. If you want to do pavements, you put it in the ground, you put gravel on top of it on natural soil. You bring the gravel, you put it on top of it. You can also do it in lay down areas because you got all these potholes out there with no geogrid reinforcements. You put your drill grid in there and you put lots of gravel on top of it, turn it into a gravel parking lot. As a lay down area, you put equipment on it. You reinforce it. Ground modification techniques. If you want to use light modification technique and your soils are clay and fine, you can use wick drain system to settle the soil, the clay soils. And it basically takes the water out and increases the effective stress. If you want to st stiffen it and go heavier, you can use other systems such as jet grouting, compaction grouting systems. If your soils are sandy, you can do the ground modification using vibration energy, dynamic compaction, vibro compaction. For clay soils, wick drains to improve the soils. As these soils become stiff clays, you use the stone columns, aggregate piers, we call them stone columns, geo piers, dynamic replacement, dynamic compaction. Soils become sandy, vibro compaction, or control modulus columns or rigid inclusions. You can use that to improve the soil conditions. If it's a shallow soil that's got soft soils, for example, you can just compact that soil by removal and replacement. If it's less than 10 feet, usually 
You can do removal, replacement, roller compaction. You can use RIC, which is a rapid impact compaction used for small areas. It's 36 inch diameter weight dropping on sandy soils. You compact it with that, increases the bearing capacity, decreases settlement. It's a device, you just bang it into the soil. It compacts the sandy soils. You can get into stone columns, goes up to about 40 feet. Dynamic compaction, weak drain, I mean, weak drains goes all the way down 120 feet or so for clay soils. Stage loading. If you have an embankment conditions, this is the Houston Sheep Channel Bridge. If you got an embankment and it's got lots of settlement soft soils, is a heavy load of the embankment or MSU walls. You're gonna have settlement problems with your bridge structures. You do what's called preloading. You go out there putting weak drain and then stack up a bunch of soil on top of it. It's the Houston airport system. You let it settle. You put the wick drains in like that. There are four inches in width. You push them into the soil, it allows the water from the soil to come up to a header pipe here. Wick drains are composite product, four inches, 0.3 inches thick, and up to 120 feet deep. Improves soil drainage, reduces settlement, in, and used in clays and silts. That's a typical wick drain system. You push them into the ground. Hydraulically, it allows the groundwater to come up. As you load it up with the stage loading, it takes the water out and the soil starts settling. This is an embankment loading. These are the weak drains. These are the soils that are soft. It pulls the water out. Increase bearing capacity and increases settlement. The settlement with other weak drains is very slow. With weak drain, you can take out the settlement with no surcharge. You put surcharge on top of it, you can take all the settlement out before put your structure on top of it. GOPRs, if you got soft soils up 40 feet, you can go out and put these stone columns in. These are gravel columns. You drill a hole, fill it up with gravel, called geopiers. Fibro aggregate piers or geopier systems, essentially you drill, it increases the bearing capacity, decreases the settlement. The effective depth is usually about 50 feet. Then you compact the gravel as you put it in. These are typical pictures of the geopiers. You can put it on the embankments, on the tank foundations. Control modular system, CMC or rigid inclusions. These are grout columns. You drill the hole in the ground, pushes the soil into the surrounding soil. There's no, uh, there's no excavated material showing up on the surface. You drill it and you grout from bottom up. Increases the bearing capacity, decreases settlement. Breaking inclusions transfer the load through the weak strata to a firm on there. You're going to have to have a strong bottom in here to put this, this system in. Uh, what happens is when the grout gets hard, is you've got a column in here. It doesn't expand like with wood geopier system. The stone columns, they, they expand and it starts settling. It goes into soft soil. This thing doesn't do that. It just starts. The main thing about it, you're going to have to have a hard layer. If you got a soft layer, it doesn't work. It's a, compar a comparison of piles versus uh, CMC. CMC is good if you got some something hard to put your tip in. If it's not, it's not any good. Effective depth of it is about 90 feet or so. 
benefits of the rigid inclusions or CMC basically increases bearing capacity, settlement reduced, reduced reduces the cost as it, as it compares to piling. And that's the device, you just put it in, you drill the hole, you got the grout, you fill it up with grout. That's what the typical hole looks like after it's grouted. Dynamic compaction, if you got sandy material, dynamic compaction is a dropping of the heavy weight on the ground surface to densify the soil. And you just drop it in there, increases the bearing capacity, mitigates liquefaction, to increase the settlement, reduce the sinkhole potential. Usually you got weights 60 to 30 tons, you drop it 40 to 80 feet on sands and silts on landfills, it compacts up to about 20 feet, I mean 50 feet. That's how you drop it on the ground, that's the weight, you drop it. Alternatively, soil mixing, basically you get the in situ soft soils, you, you mix it with cement or lime, you do it either wet or dry. The process simultaneously breaks down, breaks up the soil without removing it. And the binder is injected at low pressure and thoroughly mixed. It will be it will reinforce the soils after treatment. We've got a question here, let's see. How can we reduce vibration from dynamic compaction to the nearest structures? I don't know how this thing, you know, you cannot use dynamic compaction next to nearest structures. You just can't use it. Otherwise you're gonna have rally waves that they're gonna cause problems and you're gonna have a uh, damage to the structure. So you cannot use that method near areas where there is, you know, lots of structures. Here's mixing of the soils with either cement, lime, flash, and with the soft soils, you just go down and you mix it in. It's a mixed soil. Soil mixing method. Increases the bearing capacity, decreases settlement. Used for slope stabilization. You can use it for earth retention, liquefaction, groundwater control. You do the soil mixing. You can do it with the dry method. Basically, soil mixing involves mechanically mixing a wet soil with a dry cement binder or you can use wet method, which, you, which basically mixing them with a cementitious slurry binder. Soil mixing method uses basically uh, mixing soils and tools that tailor to site specific soils. You gotta understand the soil conditions, what, what you got out, out there. Various equipment that are used for soil mixing. This is a rotary type device here. It's an auger system. And this is a very, very basically a linear insulation method that you can put them in. Effective depth of the soil mix means 100 feet. Vibro compaction, this, this is a rod that you put in the sandy soils. It vibrates, it densifies the soil. Increases the bearing capacity, mitigated riffle. Liquefaction decreases the settlement. This is a like this just vibrates and goes into the sandy soils. These are these devices. They use them in sandy soils to densify them. It's good in sand, but you cannot use it in silts. Well, you can use it in silt, clays, you know, spoils. You cannot use them there. Effective depth, 90 feet. Jet grouting, you go out and jet grout from bottom up in here, you got a basically a device that shoots grout out there from a hole in there. It underpins foundation, seals the bottom, and provides excavation support. It's called jet grouting. You drill a hole, we got a jet in there that creates a grout. This is a typical system, that's a typical what comes out. You do jet grouting up to about 150 feet. Compaction grouting, pump highly viscous cement grout under high pressure through the pipes to soft soils. It reduces settlements, lifts foundations. So if you got soft soils in here underneath the foundation, got voids, you can do you know, pump grout in there at the high pressure 
reduces liquefaction, decreases settlement, increases bearing capacity, stabilizes sinkhole. If you got there, you just inject it into the soft soils under high pressure, try to underpin the foundation. Effective depth, 100 to about 200 feet deep. So I get going back to this old slide here. This is the original project. It's a, a change order. It costs so much more money for change order or litigation. It's important to do proper geotechnical on these projects. Look at all kinds of things, and including remedial measures, retaining walls, slope stability, and ground modifications. This ends a part two program. Uh, sometimes you may have to look at things from different angles. This is the front of the Mount Rushmore. It's the back of it, so you got to be very careful of things when you look at things. Send me pictures of the stuff. If you got pictures of good projects with ground modifications or anything else, send it to me. We got program evaluation in here. Uh, we would like for you to kind of tell us what you think of the program, and uh, please fill it in. If you need to reach me. Uh, my name is David Eastwood, and uh, my email is de at geoteching.com, 713-699-4000. we got all these programs coming up, 428. we got the Design and Construction of Forensic Evaluation of Residential Foundations. Then we got the GHBA in May. Uh, if you have all your email, we'll send you all these programs. You're going to get your PDH hour for today. You've got an hour and a half, two hours. Any questions? Well, good. There doesn't seem to be many questions in here. Everything was pretty clear. I appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully we're going to see you at the next webinar. Thank you.